This is the almost time in the newsletter for the week of February 25th, 2024. Content authenticity statement. 95% of this newsletter is made by me, the human. You'll see some outputs from Gemini in the opening section. This week, what's on my mind? Principles-based prompt engineering. Today, let's talk about principles-based prompt engineering and why prompt engineering matters. There's basically two two-ish schools of thought about prompt engineering. One is that prompt engineering is a vital practice to maximize performance. If you don't do it, you're doing it wrong. And the other is that prompt engineering as a discipline is just a total waste of time because models are so smart now that they can eventually infer what you mean. Unsurprisingly, the right answer requires a lot more nuance than just a binary this or that. This is the right way or those sorts of perspectives. It depends my favorite expression, on the context. Right? It is true that prompt engineering for the largest models like GPT-4 and Gemini requires much less precision now than it did two years ago uh, when you had to follow very strict formats. But it is also true that prompt engineering as a discipline enhances your productivity and gets you to a better answer faster. Why is this the case? Predominantly because Language is imprecise, right? There are so many ways to express a concept in language that to be clear, we need to be precise. If I say, I'm happy I met up with friends this week, that's a surprisingly vague statement. We accept it as is because it comes across as casual conversation and thus we're not expected to do very much with it except acknowledge it in, in conversation, but unpack it. Which friends? Where? Why did they make me happy? How do we become friends? When you stop to think about it, there's a vast sea of unanswered questions in that just one little sentence. If I say I'm happy with my, I met up with my friends Judith and Ruby this week, friends of mine from various Discord communities who are brilliant artists that teach me about art and music theory, that tells you a lot more about who they are, a suggestion of why we're friends, how we met, well, you get the idea. Even just a few more words adds precision in the original statement. Why do we use such imprecise language? Again, some of it's conversational habit, uh, and the rest is context. In long-term friendships and relationships, we communicate data over uh, a period of time that's recalled and augmented. When I'm talking with my CEO and friend Katie about uh, really anything on a day-to-day -day basis, she's not relying on information alone from that conversation, but on nearly a decade's worth of interactions with me. If I mention Brooke or Donna, just the names alone behave as a shorthand that invokes an incredible amount of information, long-term information, which Katie recalls and loads into her working memory in the conversation. You have that experience regularly. Think of the name of a close friend or loved one. How much is associated with that person? Think of a favorite food. Just the name of it can invoke memories and sensations. So if language is so powerful, why do we need prompt engineering? Well, because the memory in a large language model or vision model is generalized. Your memories of a friend, of a favorite food, uh, of a past relationship are so specific to you and rooted in emotions that only you can truly know. Those same words have much more generic associations in a language model and thus when it recalls them from its long-term memory and loads them into its short-term memory in the conversation, they're non-specific. They're not specific to you and thus they have no emotional impact because emotional impact comes from specificity. This is why prompt engineering is important. Not because we can't use language models without specific prompts, but because skillful prompting helps us achieve greater specificity. Skillful prompting helps us achieve greater effectiveness in AI-generated outputs. This is especially true with smaller models like Gemma or Llama 2 or Mistral, which have smaller long-term memories, and thus our prompting has to be much more specific, often in a format that the model has been trained to recognize. For example, a Llama 2 format uh, has a specific input line, a specific output line, and your prompt has to fit that exact prompt for it to work well. That's essentially what the model expects to see, and when it doesn't, it doesn't know what to do. It goes off the rails or it follows directions poorly. Tools like ChatGPT and Gemini, this sort of thing is still needed, but it happens behind the scenes by the software makers. Um, th these system prompts exist, they're just concealed from you and me. We can't see them, but they, they, they look, they're actually quite extensive. Now let's talk about the mechanics, the principles of prompt engineering. The model of a short-term memory and a long-term memory is especially apt for explaining how language models work conceptually. Uh, the data they're trained on forms a statistical library that acts like a long-term memory. Uh, albeit fixed, right? Me models don't automatically learn from what we prompt from them. That has to be added in by software developers. So short-term memory 
is our interaction with the model in a session, in a conversation. And the short-term memory's capacity varies based on the model. Some models, like the original Llama model, have a very short, small short-term memory, about 1,500 words. Some models, like Google's new Gemini 1.5 model, have a 700,000 word memory, right? That's a bookshelf of memory. Those folks who've been using ChatGPT since the early days, remember early on, it seemed to have amnesia relatively soon after you started talking to it. And that amnesia is because its short-term memory got full and it started to forget what you talked about early in the conversation. When we prompt, we are effectively pulling information out of long-term memory, conceptually, not actually, and into short-term memory. Here's the thing about prompts. The length of the prompt consumes some of the short-term memory. So prompt engineering can be, depending on the model, a skillful balance of important words to trigger memories balanced with an efficient prompt that isn't pages long of extraneous language that doesn't provoke memories but does consume the available memory. If you look at the folks who are selling you know, amazing prompts and stuff on LinkedIn and whatever, they generally fall into two categories, specific use case templates and highly compressed memory triggers that invoke specific memories in very little space. Frankly, these are both things you can generate yourself using the language model of your choice. The challenge with this style of prompt engineering is that it's not principles-based, right? So it's never clear to the user why a prompt does or does not work. When we understand concepts, principles like long-term and short-term memory and word triggers, it becomes much more clear why some prompts perform better than others. Here's a concrete example. Let's say we're designing a piece of software in the Python programming language and we're using a language model to help generate the code. The first thing we'd want to do is write out the requirements of the code and something that looks like, you know, requirements. This is a Python 3 script running on Mac OS Sonoma. This script takes the input in the form of a text file with a command line argument input. Once the input file is loaded, use any text processing library to count the parts of speech. Produce a count of the parts of speech. We'll create a table as an output. Make the table a CSV file. Use TQDM to demonstrate the progress of the script. These requirements get pasted to the bottom of our code. Why? Because short-term memory is limited. If we continually reinsert our requirements by copying them into the short-term memory, then the model doesn't forget what we want it to do. It stays on the rails. This is principles-based prompt engineering. By understanding how the models work, our prompts can be more effective because we're not locked into rigid templates that we don't understand why they work. We understand that the short-term memory of a language model requires refreshing, and if we do that, we keep it on the rails longer. And this technique doesn't just apply to code, it applies to any long-form work you're doing with language models. If you're writing an article, for example, you might want to preserve the general outline of the article to make sure it's available in short-term memory the whole time that you're writing the article, every time you prompt it. Some systems like ChatGPT's custom instructions or GPT's and its new memory feature and LM Studio's prompt instructions, they preserve this information automatically in the prompts. Other systems like Gemini will need you to do this manually. Principles-based prompt engineering also tends to work better with uh, across models, right? That is, if you know what's under the hood and how it works, your prompts will be more easily portable from one system to another, from Gemini to ChatGPT and so on and so forth. Understand how generative AI works under the hood and you'll make everything you do more effective. All right, what's happening in the news this week? Obviously, I am on the road. I am currently in London. I actually have to stop the recording every minute or so for planes to fly overhead from Heathrow, which is kind of fun. You're coming in awfully low. Besides the new AI course that I'm relentlessly flogging, this week I recommend the podcast episode Katie and I did on answering the question of how to do predictive analytics when you don't have much data to predict from. Upcoming jobs this week, we have AI Ambassador at Accenture Health, Content Strategist at Acquient, Senior Digital Analytics Engineer at Tracken, Senior Implementation Analyst at Growth Runner, Strategy and Analytics Consulting Manager at Seer Interactive, and VP of Foundational Modeling at Aut Autonomy uh, Labs. So lots of jobs happening in the AI space. Be sure that you are checking those out. Let's see what's happening in other news this week. We have social media marketing, uh, LinkedIn evolving data privacy approaches in marketing. We have new reports on TikTok usage. We have Ahrefs use cases for content marketers, the cure to content marketing creative blocks. Google looking to answer its enhance its AI generated performance max campaigns in Google ads and uh, paying Reddit for more content. It's kind of interesting. I guess they've got a big content deal. Mistral announced its next model, Mistral Next, aptly named. Uh, and some really cool stuff happening in the modeling space. Uh, Gemma, Google's model, was just announced this week. It's, a, it's an open model, 7 billion parameter model that any of us can download and run with. And from early reports, it seems to be pretty capable. IBM has a good piece on climate change predictions and another one on data monetization that's worth reading. 
upcoming events. I've got a marketing process event coming up in March follow, that's online, followed by the Society for Marketing Professional Services in April and May, both in Boston and L.A., then Melbourne for the Australian Food and Grocery Council in May, and Macon in Cleveland, and Marketing Process B2B Forum in October in Boston. So that is the newsletter for this week, the mobile one here from London, England. Thank you for tuning in, watching, and listening. I hope that you had a great week, and I hope to, you have a great one ahead. Thanks for tuning in. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. And if you want to know when new videos are available, hit the bell button to be notified as soon as new content is live.